everybody. I'm Bob Parsons, your host. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Career Accelerator Lecture Series. Uh, this series was begun in uh, 2020. Uh, it's an initiative of the Engineering uh, Advisory Board. Uh, their goal was to provide opportunities for you to um, have, an, have an opportunity to interact more with uh, senior individuals who have been, who are graduates of our program, who've gone on and, and been very successful in a number of walks of life, and just share their experiences, what's worked for them, and uh, provide what guidance they can on how to approach your career so that you might accelerate your career path. And that's the basis for the Career Accelerator Lecture Series. We've had a number of wonderful talks. They're all recorded, they're all on YouTube. I'd encourage you to flip through the engineering webpage and you, there's a whole list of them there. And uh, everything from personal finance to, to career goals, to additional education, to the importance of uh, joining professional societies, to all sorts of things. Communication, leadership. So today, uh, and we're gonna continue that uh, process today. Carrie Neshleba, one of our graduates, uh, graduated from KU with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering in 1996. From there she went to California to start a job at Intel, thinking she'd be back in Kansas in a few years. Instead she stayed at Intel Corporation in California where she enjoyed a great career for 26 years. She just joined the startup company Ampere Computing as the Senior Director of Quality. She lives in Mountain View, California with her husband, son Eric, and daughter Brooke. She enjoys sports, HIIT, and I don't know what that is. High intensity interval training. Okay, and reading and keeping up with friends. So the way this is gonna work is she's gonna present for a little while and be thinking of questions as we go along. We'll, ha we'll, have, uh, and I don't know, we'll have questions at the end and we want you to ask questions. And we may, we'll have a few prizes perhaps for those who ask questions. So uh, be thinking about that and with that, turn it over to Karen. All right, thank you. I'm not sure how I feel about the senior comment, but um, <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, no, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. I know, you know, as a speaker, you never know if one person's going to show up or many. So I'm glad it's many. Uh, so thanks for showing up and taking time out of your day. Um, yeah, I graduated in 1996. Um, it's been a long time since I've been back. Um, and I, lots of memories walking around. Uh, we just had learn at Hall when I was here. It's amazing to see everything that's built out. Uh, and one, uh, you know, one of my memories is senior year, we built a recumbent bicycle out of carbon fiber uh, and raced it at a, at a race in Reno. And one of our first prototypes was a steel frame that we just bolted together just to try to see fit and function. And we went out behind the school here and rode it. It's not a huge hill, but we rode it down the sidewalk hill and it was enough when you don't have brakes in a steel frame that it was a little bit sketchy, but uh, I don't think anyone knew we were actually doing that, so, um, so fun times. But um, no, I'm excited to talk today, and I hope that some of the things that I share uh, will resonate with you as you're thinking about getting out into the workforce. Um, some of the things that I've learned uh, and taken away with me and continue to build on uh, as I continue my career, so. Uh, you know, growing up, I grew up in Prairie Village, Kansas, and I thought that I would end up settling around the Kansas City area. I thought my parents would stay together and grow old together. I'm the oldest of four. I thought we'd all just end up living around the area because that's what my grandparents did, my mom, my aunts, my uncles. It just was the thing. Um, but then senior or sophomore year of high school, my parents went through a pretty ugly divorce, and it really just shifted everything. Um, food became a scarcity. Money became a scarcity. And I became laser focused on getting out of there, just graduating and getting to, to college, um, which I did and uh, had to pay for myself. Uh, but thankfully with loans and some scholarships was able to do that. Um, three meals a day freshman year was such an amazing thing. So you never know what's going on with people and you never know how resilient you can be through these different challenges. 
and work just adds another profile of challenge and rewards, amazing experiences and hard experiences on top of what you'll experience in life. And it's similar to school and, and life, but I think school and life are pretty intertwined uh, in college. Um, but you've got a couple profiles that you're going to meander through as you go, as you go, and being able to uh, really rely on some essential skills uh, will help you through that, and has really resonated uh, with me as we've gone through. So a little bit more about me. Um, so. Uh, Mechanical engineering, I had two internships to guide my way uh, to Intel eventually. So I did an internship uh, where I was a research assistant at Boston University. That was the first time I had left Kansas, first time being on an airplane. Um, and so uh, it was a huge experience. Um, but it also opened the door to uh, the computer industry for me. And as a mechanical engineer, that's not, you know, it's more electrical engineering, chemical, material science. Uh, mechanical engineering is very small subset of uh, computer and semiconductors uh, really opened the door because of the study that this particular uh, professor was, was doing. Uh, it got me into the door then with Micron in my junior year for an internship there. Micron is a memory company up in Idaho. And at the time, in 1995, memory was going crazy. Hugely expensive, very uh, huge volumes, and um, left that internship with a job offer for the following summer. Um, then through those experiences and networking, we had a very active KU alum at Intel who actively recruited here uh, every year, made connections with him, uh, and he was able to connect me with a job opportunity to, at Intel. So uh, 26 years at Intel, uh, hugely rewarding, not in the same job, uh, really meandered through and had probably five or six, seven different jobs within Intel. And that's something you can enjoy with a big company. You don't have to leave the company to try something new. And you can bring in all that tangential experience and knowledge into just a different group. So I enjoyed many different uh, opportunities at Intel. And about three months ago, I resigned. And uh, two months ago, started at Ampere Computing. So I went from a 140,000 person company to a 1,200 person company. So it's considered a large startup. We just hit our five year anniversary. So, um, so having a ton of fun, it's been completely rejuvenating and re-energizing uh, for me. Uh, on the left is graduation day uh, from KU. Uh, two of my ME classmates and two people that I'm still uh, close with uh, today, even though we live in just way different areas. In the middle picture is just about two weeks ago when uh, the Chiefs played the 49ers. Uh, I went to the game in, San in uh, Santa Clara uh, and uh, enjoyed seeing the Chiefs beat up on the Niners. And uh, my son didn't come with us, so I inserted a picture of him uh, at our San Jose Earthquakes MLS Major League Soccer team. Uh, he's a goalie, so he got a picture with a goalie. So those are my kids and my family. Um, and for hobbies, yeah, I like to work out. Fitness has always been, fitness, athletics, sports have always been a part of my life. I started playing soccer in fourth grade and just never really looked back at, um, at, at being idle. Um, so I continue to do that. And the morning time when I work out is really me time. It's before the day starts. It's before I become a mom. It's before I become an employee. It's really my time. So uh, I enjoy that reading wine, scotch, and whiskey. You'll probably grow a taste for that maybe eventually. Uh, spending time with friends, and really, I am a soccer mom. So um, I want to talk a little bit. I'm not going to talk a lot about semiconductors and what Intel and what I do at Ampere, but I wanted to talk and give a very brief uh, introduction. So semiconductors, uh, semiconductor itself is a material that has high conductivity, and we use it in building electronics, especially computer chips. Um, it comes from sand. It gets processed and turns into silicon that then goes into every electrical device that you have, um, cars, laptops, phones, and then data centers. And data centers are really where I focus. Um, these are where millions of computer chips or CPUs sit and are used to store data, uh, process data, 
websites uh, and run video, gaming, whatever it might be, whether it's Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they all have data centers where they have massive amounts of compute power. I work on the computer chips that go into those systems, and my job as a quality uh, and reliability engineer is to really make sure that that part is gonna work when it comes out of the box and at their, at their data center, and that it lasts for five to six, seven years. So we do a lot of electrical validation, we stress the part, we really try to break it, and we do a ton of statistical modeling to see how is this part going to respond. A lot of transistor theory, um, things that don't I don't really understand, but I can apply it, and I can lead teams that do, uh, do the, understand all the details. So wanted, I wanted to talk about success. Success is really all in how you individually define success for you. It can mean something different for everybody. You know, making money, having a stable income, being able to buy a house, um, being, able to buy the, being able to buy that favorite car that you've always wanted, uh, making VP, making president, being CEO of your own company. Your definition of success is really for you, and that's for you to, uh, to really figure out, and it may change over the course of your life. But there's, there are some consistencies, no matter what your definition of success is, that will play out as you pursue that success. Now, I've enjoyed watching the football team, as I'm sure you have, uh, be a bit more successful this season. Uh, when I was here my first year, we went to the Aloha Bowl under Glenn Mason, and then nothing else. So um, it's really exciting to see some wins. Um, so really, you know, it's an analogy of sports. As, and sports, work, really anything. But your education, your intelligence, and your willingness to work hard is gonna get you in the door. It's gonna get you the job, it'll get you the interview, and it'll get you in the door. Just like these college hopefuls are working hard to be able to get drafted and get onto a professional team. But it's really what you do after that that's gonna determine how successful you are in that career. It's really not, it's just like when you came from high school, it got you into college, you started fresh. You leave college, it gets you into your job, and then you start fresh. Um, so really, what is it that's gonna differentiate you from everyone else who's working hard, who's smart, who's getting paid to do the job? How are you gonna differentiate yourself? And I hate to tell you, but careers typically, unless you get really lucky and make a lot of money on a startup or a great idea and you can retire early, uh, your career is gonna last between 30 to 50 years. And so that longevity is really, t is pretty taxing on you at times. And so how do you stay resilient over the course of that entire career? So there's kind of a simple equation. You guys are engineers, so I thought I'd throw at least one you know, equation in here, although this isn't, this isn't a difficult one. But really success, and however you've defined it, is work ethic, how you apply your intelligence and education to the work, and then the results that you achieve and deliver. Results are always uh, necessary. And then there's kind of this X factor. And you do these things, and you can achieve the success that you have set out before you. Um, these are kind of the table stakes to get into a job. Everyone's smart. Everyone was chosen out of uh, the interview pool. Everyone wants to work hard and prove themselves. Um, so those X factors are really the factors that are gonna lead to a successful, long, and fulfilling career. There are many X factors you could think of. Uh, the ones that I'm going to focus on today that I find and have found in my 26 years are kind of some of the most important ones. And you can find outliers to these examples as we go through, I'll point out a few. Uh, but character and resiliency. So who you are when you go into that job and how you're gonna sustain yourself uh, going through that. These are key things to how in a long career, uh, you can have success. So let's go into character. You know, what, who are you as a person, and how are you gonna show up in the job? 
Um, are you going to be the type of person that people want to work with? Are you going to be, a, or maybe you're going to be the type of person that uh, just kind of uses people for their information but never gives them credit? Uh, are you going to help people feel valued and bring attention to their work? Are you going to be a team player? Or are you going to go it solo? These are all things that you have to think about of what do you want to bring and how do you want to project yourself in the job? And you can tell I'm a little biased. There are good ways and there are not so good ways. Trampling on people, stealing people's work, generally not a good thing. So when I left Intel, um, I was really pleasantly I was pleasantly, uh, I won't say surprised necessarily, because I'd gotten a lot of feedback from my uh, teams over the years, but it was very fulfilling to me to get so many emails with people telling me of what they will value in the, the relationship that we had at work. It could be someone in my organization who was two or three layers down that I had connected with and really worked to reach out to. It could be coworkers. It could be people that I had never really directly worked, in, worked with, but who knew me from afar and had seen and liked things that they observed. Just a lot of people saying they valued how I put people first how I built trust and approached them with transparency. And that really let them feel like I, as a valued person, that they were willing to work hard to achieve the high expectations that I set. And that's really the, one of the key things is, you know, you want to make a positive difference. And the thing to remember is people will remember how you make them feel. When I left, yeah, my boss, you know, at, we put together a list of some accomplishments, you know, some of the big ones I was really proud of. But it was the feedback from people and what they remembered and how they felt I treated them uh, and what they took away in my strengths of leadership that really meant the most to me. And it wasn't, hey, great, you enabled this cool you knew, new process. It was, you took the time to get to know me and know what I was working on. You helped and coached and mentored, and I am forever grateful. I mean, that kind of stuff is what, as a manager and a leader, and really anyone, you know, it, it just it helps. It makes you feel good that you were able to reach people on a personal level. So just remember, people will remember how you made them feel. You can think back to coaches, teachers, friends. You might remember, remember a few specific things, but you'll also just remember a general feeling that you have. Um, some of the things that uh, are just super important is really be authentic. It, it goes back to who are you going to be at work. And you can try to fake it. You can try to be someone else. But you will be seen through. And maybe you're a really bad person and you're trying to pretend to be good, and that's a good thing. But I think most of the time, you know, just being yourself and being transparent and being honest with people uh, is really the best way to connect. Being inclusive, so hearing and listening and seeking input from others. Um, you don't, you get the best ideas when you can bring uh, more voices who have different perspectives together. Um, be respectful, even to the cafeteria workers, to the janitors who are toiling away, keeping the business running, keeping you fed, keeping the office area clean so that you can make the job, you can make the company better. They have their role and we have ours and we are all in it to make the company better. So respectful of anywhere, anyone up and down the chain. And be present. You know, I've had, ma I've had managers who I can hear typing away, doing email while we're ta having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I get the uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm. And then when I pause, a whole new topic comes out of his mouth. Well, I know he wasn't paying attention and wasn't present. So am I going to trust him? Not really. So people will trust you. And one way to gain trust and gain that connection is be present. Um, the other thing, too, is you never know what's going on in other people's lives. Someone may have a really bad day and just rip your head off. But maybe that's not the normal way that they operate, and you know it. A little bit of grace, a little bit of patience, and even with yourself. Bad days happen. You never know what's going on with someone's 
personal life. And you just never know what they're carrying with them as they try to tackle these technical business challenges. So a little bit of grace as you're moving through the world is always appreciated. Now, you can think back to some team projects. Uh, as I understand it, way more team project focused since I was here. Senior year was really the first time we got together and did team projects. I think it's amazing and awesome that that's really something that starts freshman year now, because that is how work is. You work with people. Um, but think back to some of those, and there's always someone who doesn't pull their weight. <laughs> and you gotta pick up the slack. Or someone who doesn't appreciate the work that you did and they do their own and put it in there and ignore yours. Those aren't the people that you are gonna choose to work with again in the next engineering class, right? And five years from now, they apply for a job in your group, are you gonna hire them? Probably not, you have a pretty bad taste in your mouth from the last interaction. So you really want to be a teammate that others are seeking out. Be accountable for the work you do. Be accountable for mistakes you make. Be accountable and trustworthy that you're going to do the job that you signed up for and that you're gonna deliver it to the best of your ability. And guess what? Everyone is pushing the envelope. We make mistakes. It really is about learning from those and then recovering. How do you learn from that and make it better going forward? This is really, uh, where the teamwork uh, environment is, is key, because you can learn from each other. The other thing I would say is get your hands dirty. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've interviewed recent college graduates, and they want to jump in and immediately be running program management. They want to run cross-company programs and drive you know, these high visibility type efforts. I applaud the ambition, don't get me wrong, but you don't know how the company works, well not you, they don't know how the company works, they don't know how decisions are made, they don't know the product that well, they read some stuff on the internet, but they don't know how the product gets made. And to go in and, un and not understand what risks might come up, how we might avoid those risks, how we might overcome the risks and mistakes, being able to lead a team as a program manager through those types of decisions, it really takes getting your hands dirty and learning the ropes of the company, learn the business, and then appreciate the work that everyone is doing. And you really only do that if you're getting in there and trying it out. I don't know how many times at Intel I went and did, you know, the grunt work. Went down to the lab, I was checking, I was, making some designs, and I needed to run some experiments to see what kind of solder paste we were gonna use for solder balls. Technician could have done it. I could have just sent an order down, had them do it, but I did it, and I learned that actually what looked clean and easy on paper was actually not feasible in reality viscosity of the, the material we were using, the spacing, the pitch, everything about it, I realized, man, you know, theoretical versus reality. And you don't get that by program managing right out the bat. So get your hands dirty, you learn, and you can take back now that learnings, and I made a better design that was way more successful than it would have been if I hadn't gotten into the lab and done that work. So don't be afraid of those jobs and digging in. Don't think that they're below you, you know, that's not what you were brought in for. No, so don't spend all your time doing it, but go spend some time learning those details. So when I came out of school, I uh, had enjoyed you know, three meals a day. I had loans and scholarships that helped pave the way and pay for school. Uh, but I was ready for a steady paycheck. And I thought, things are pretty smooth, right? I'll get a steady paycheck. I don't have to do homework on weekends and nights. I'm gonna have all this free time. And my career's just gonna go. You know, I'm gonna get married by this age and kids and you know, it's just all gonna just go. Well, you know, things don't go that uh, to plan. And th 
the other part of it was I had a desktop computer. Oh man, I'm really dating myself. I did not have a laptop. Laptops were not really a thing yet. Maybe the road warriors had them, but it was not a thing yet. And so if you had to work more, you had to go into the office. Now you have a computer in your hand. And you can, I mean, I've got work email just popping up and going crazy. I can answer it any time. I can get on Teams and I am with people in California and India and always on. I can do it while I'm waiting in line for lunch and when I am brushing my teeth for bed. So I'm all, you can be, always be on. And when you think about doing that for 30 to 50 years, and I don't even know what you guys are gonna come up with and what invention is going to happen in the next 20 years, uh, but it's, it's demanding. And so that resiliency factor of how do you go through a long-term career, especially one that's so flexible, but very invasive. And you know, like any good plan, you plan for the best case scenario and other things happen. And there are gonna be points in your life where work is going great and maybe life is really handing you just a real difficult time. Um, a lot of times I look at my life and I'm like, well, it's pretty boring right now. If I was a soap opera, I would not be very popular because it's just so boring. You know, we just start living every day. And then there are other times when it's great and other times when it's really hard. And then you mesh a work profile up on top of that. And, you know, you can see where maybe work's going really well, but suddenly you're taking care of, hopefully not for a long time for you guys, but taking care of an aged parent or grandparent. Uh, there may be times when your kids are sick. Uh, maybe you have a major injury. You know, there's all sorts of things that can derail you. And really having that resiliency to be able to work through that. Um, I call it career an ultra marathon. So some of the things that I have found to be the best for me in terms of mentally healthy, engaged with work, and uh, enjoying my job. The first and foremost thing is surrounding yourself with good people. Now you don't always get to choose your boss, but you can choose how long you stay there. Um, the number one reason for changing jobs is the manager. So uh, a manager is just key. And I've changed, I changed my job several times at Intel, like I said. And the key reason most of the time was because of the manager. Eventually, I felt like I maybe outgrew the manager um, or we just diverged in vision and strategy and I felt like I could no longer express my opinion because I knew my manager was not aligned to that and it would just lead to an argument. Well, now I'm not bringing my whole self to the job. I'm having to hold back. I'm not growing and they're not getting the best of me because I'm holding back. And so you don't want to get into that position. So really work, try to work for a good person um, and with awesome coworkers. They may not be your immediate group, but find the people that you work with, find the talent, find the go-to people, wherever they are in the company and make them part of uh, who you surround yourself with. And one way you can do this is actually interview your boss. So when you're getting interviewed for a job, have questions ready to ask them. How do you handle mistakes? How do you celebrate milestones? How, what's a normal day look like? Can you tell me a little bit about the backgrounds of the people on your team? Different things that maybe are important to you or that you've learned as you go through your career that you want to investigate and interview your manager. It's as much about them seeing if you're a fit with their company as it is you determining are they a fit for you. And ask to talk to a couple of your coworkers um, and do the same thing, ask them questions. You can ask them, what's a real day like? What's the boss like? You know, how are the people? So take that opportunity of an interview and bring your questions and be ready to ask uh, questions to the, to the boss. You will absolutely find more success if you feel like you can bring your whole self and express all of your thoughts in a situation than if you are finding you have to limit what you say because people don't agree. That's just not a good fit. Go find a new job. And it's hard to quit. I can tell you after a brutal 
uh, reorg that uh, the whole company went through. Um, really brutal layoffs. Um, I hope never a company never does it that way again. Um, we had a lot of changes, and so someone who was a peer became my manager. And I struggled for probably a year and a half trying to really make that work, make that relationship work. Uh, we had very different views on the role of the team, on where we could grow, on where we could step in and be a key functional partner for the organization. Uh, and he was very dedicated and focused on his own career and making himself uh, be successful. Uh, I struggled for about a year and a half, and in working with a coach um, uh, that I had been paired up with, we finally, you know, I finally broke through that, okay, I hate quitting, but this is so non-healthy for me that I need to try something new. I will fail if I don't quit this job that I like. Now, luckily, it was within Intel, um, and I was able to move and find something else. But when you reach that point, sometimes uh, not very few of us like to quit things, um, and it's hard. But sometimes you have to really evaluate, are you able to bring everything to the table that you think you can? So as part of that exploration, when I was having that difficulty, um, I reached out to my network. When I made that decision that I needed to make a change, I reached out and I talked with managers that I wanted to work for and let them know I was looking for a new opportunity, that I wanted an opportunity on their staff and wasn't in a rush, but was definitely going to be uh, looking and wanted to be considered. And two months later, I did have one of the managers that I really respected come and contact me and ask me to apply for a, a large role on his staff, um, which I got and um, enjoyed five more years there before I re resigned. So using, that's one example of how to use a network. You really want to use a network and find, like I mentioned before, find the other talent in the company. You know, talent finds talent. And you can do a lot of fun stuff if you're working with really capable people who value you and who you value. And reciprocate that. If people come to you with questions, coaching, seeking advice, reciprocate and give that. And then really have career discussions with those you admire. And don't just sit down and say, hey, uh, what should I think about? Actually come with some questions, especially exploring how they got to where they are. And then on the life side, um, you know, you really want to have a couple different groups that you hang out with. Maybe you've got your work friends, you've got your friend friends, uh, you've got the party friends, and then you've got maybe the sports team friends or hobby. Uh, a group of friends that enjoy the same hobbies. It's really good to have these different social networks. Uh, if one fails, maybe work, maybe the company closes. Maybe people that you hung out with move away. Uh, it's really good to have those different connection points um, that you can rely on through those different periods of time. The other piece um, that I really believe in is finding joy on a daily basis. And joy can mean a lot of things, but I mean something that brings you personal foundation of, it can be fun, it can be joy, it can be relaxation, it can be whatever it is to you that refreshes you, that sheds the stress from the day for even 10 minutes. Something that you do for yourself. Um, I, find, I call that finding joy uh, when I get to do something for just myself. Um, maybe it's exercising. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same thing every day. Some days I have just enough time to drink coffee, sit out in the sun, and just have five minutes by myself. Whatever it is, gardening, reading, hanging with friends, maybe listening to music, going to concerts, Maybe you're into art, spending time and actually pursuing that and having that as part of your day. Meditation, whatever it is. Find some time every day to do that. And again, it's just, the, it's just enough to shed a little bit of that stress and be able to really then tackle the rest of the week. All of this will be going on and through your life you're going to be in different seasons. You're going to have seasons where you're just 
nailing it. Everything's going great. And you're super energetic. Everything's positive. There are going to be other seasons when maybe you know you're not. Maybe there are some things that have happened. Um, maybe financially struggling, whatever it might be. There are different seasons. You also have different seasons where you're single. If you choose to be married or partnered with someone, you're married, no kids, then you have kids. Or maybe you're older and don't have kids. It's all going to be your life's journey. But through those different seasons, you may have different priorities. When my kids were super little, I maybe declined some of the extra projects that were coming my way at work because I just couldn't work 60, 80 hours. I really needed to try to keep it down to 40, 50 hours uh, and uh, focus on the kids. Um, that happens, and that's going to change out throughout life. So one thing for you is to figure out where your true north is, what is really important to you. And really anchor on that so that as you move through these different situations and these different seasons of your life, you're anchoring your decisions and your priorities on really what you yourself hold true. And that will change over time. But if you continue to reflect on it, you can adjust and grow with that. The last thing I thought I would offer are some book suggestions. Um, Jobs is about Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and Shoe Dog. Phil Knight is the founder of Nike. Uh, all of those three are uh, biographies. I don't autobiography for Shoe Dog, um, but biographies about pretty influential, successful people. Um, but it gives a behind the scenes look at the effort, the passion, the drive, the amount of time it took to build these companies. You can kind of sometimes feel like these things took, you know, it was really fast. I mean, Nike just happened. Apple just happened. It took years and years and years of blood, sweat, and tears to make those companies happen and bring those ideas to life. I find it fascinating to read that. I personally do not have that passion to spend that much time on one thing, but uh, you might. And it's a good perspective on if you're thinking about starting your own company, just what it might take. Uh, and several, I would say there are probably character flaws in each of these people. Uh, and maybe aren't, uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are well known to not be the nicest people. So they don't really fit my X factor of character. Uh, but they were successful. So, um, uh, and really changed the world. So those are three. Failure is not an option by Gene Krantz. He was the flight uh, director for the Apollo missions. And again, taking and looking back at such old technology and what they were able to do and the engineering that went into it and what went into getting people on the moon and into space, uh, fascinating. And as an engineer, made total sense in terms of how they went through those problem solving. So another fascinating book. And then The Happiness Advantage by Sean Otter. I wish I had found this book earlier. It is, he studies in happiness, <laughs> obviously. But you know, we always are tend to say, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I graduate. I'll be happy when I get a job. I'll be happy when I can buy that car that I've always wanted. I'll be happy when I make VP. There's always something that you think as a milestone is going to make you happy. And I can tell you, when you finally do get that promotion, that euphoria lasts three days, a week, until you realize your job is still the same. You're still doing the same job that you did that maybe you didn't like, but you were doing because you wanted to be a VP. Well, now you're there, and you're in that job. You can change jobs. But the point being, those are point in time. Those aren't truly going to be sustained happiness. And what he is studying and has uh, done a lot of research on is actually to show that if you are happy in the process and in the journey and you find ways to do that, and this book gives seven or eight techniques uh, that are very applicable, then you will be happier along the way. And they actually have shown that you are more successful the happier you are. 
And happiness has a wide range of emotion, but I highly recommend this one. Um, and maybe read it again when you're about 30 uh, and kind of settling into you know career and uh, a little bit further along. But I wish I had found it earlier. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating area of study and uh, really applicable to uh, to bringing success and having that longevity uh, along the way. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, I know it's tough. It's 4 o'clock on a Tuesday. You guys probably had 7 a.m. meeting or meetings, classes. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you can use some of these and that it will help you have a long and happy career. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, questions? Over here. <laughs> um, when you were like a freshman and sophomore in college, did you like always want to work on computer chips or did that just like come like, just throughout like your years of college? Yeah, it kind of came through the years. So my freshman year was when we got email for the first time. Um, <laughs> I feel so old. Um, and, uh, and you could kind of see the wave of technology and then also talking with um, one of my classmates was someone who had been out in the industry for five, six years and had come back to school. And so just hearing their perspective also on what they were seeing in terms of the change and use of technology in business. Um, so you know more computers, email, the internet. Um, and so I, I just kind of felt that that was an area that was growing. Um, I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I knew I loved engineering, and I knew I loved mechanical engineering. I'm a very tangible, tactile person. I visually learn, and so mechanical engineering is is good for that. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of I kind of stumbled into it and uh, got lucky with a few opportunities that um, was able to make take a, take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I've got some. Yeah. There you go. Oops. Thank you. Yeah. Is there something you wish you would have done more of a last time in college? Uh, I wish I had taken five years instead of four uh, and had more fun. Um, you know, once you grow up and get out of college, there's just adulthood, you know. Uh, and while it's fun and has a lot of freedoms, it's also, you know, there's bills to pay, there's work to do, there's, you know, thing, there's responsibilities that you didn't have when you were in college. And so I, I kind of wish I had taken an extra year, maybe done some extra studies um, uh, to fill that year. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess, <laughs> ironically, maybe it's a bad thing to say, but I wish I had more fun. I had my own fun, but uh, looking back and realizing that that kind of ends the, college is kind of your fewest levels of responsibility as a young adult, and so I kind of wish I had taken advantage of that a little bit more. Um, maybe in all reality, uh, um, I think there were some other, if I think, a bit more educationally. Um, taking more statistics um, actually would have been good. In the day, it was a very basic, we had to take a very basic statistics, which was great because it was an easy A, but uh, really didn't help me out in the world, so I had to kind of learn that as I went. And I can tell you, you know, with the data analytics, uh, process systems, um, artificial intelligence, all we're, the world is moving into a space where there is so much information this people who and businesses who can pull the value out of that information are going to be the ones that succeed. And so statistics, programming, um, data systems, uh, systems engineering in general uh, are some of the things that probably would have been really helpful to have um, and stick around for a fifth year to, to take those. So yeah, uh, let's see. One more and then I think over there. So. so you like mentioned, first of all, did, did, were you part of the hiring team like when people are uh, coming in? Yep. So what, what really stood out to you with some of the candidates? Was it like bringing up the resiliency and like character mm -hmm. um, that like and them talking about that or what was like the experience? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's kind of a mix. So. Uh, I think first looking on paper, um, I would look at GPA, 
Um, I would look at what kind of clubs, activities, internships, jobs, even if it's grading papers um, and uh, uh, I don't know, working in the cafeteria. Like it was just good to know that people were spending their time elsewhere other than on school all the time. Uh, so I would look at that variety and then I would look at, of course, what they studied and if they did any research, obviously digging into there. I think when you get into, so I think including those extra activities are, are good. It shows a well-roundedness. It shows, you know, uh, uh, just where the time was spent. And if you had a 4.0 and you were really active in all those things, I mean, kudos. Uh, if I also looked for people that had maybe a 3.2 to a 3.6, because those are people like me uh, who weren't getting straight A's, but worked really hard and had other stuff going on. So those are kind of the things that kind of um, maybe get people in the door for my interviews. And then I think coming, I want to hear, can people tell me what they studied in a way that I can understand? You know, I don't know that area as well as they do. So I want to see, can they communicate to me in a way that I can understand? Uh, communication is a huge key. It's probably another X factor, actually, is just your communication. Uh, and then from there, I get some of the personality aspects. So I'll ask behavioral questions. And that's where some of the, the more like essential other skills will come out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question was, uh, when I was leaving Intel, did I have any reservations or thought process there? So um, yeah, that was a manager thing. Um, and so I had worked for the general manager of this group for, a couple, for two years. And um, I was peers with uh, a VP, another senior director, and myself. And we all had similar jobs, and we were supposed to be really uh, kind of uh, paired and um, and working together on the same level. Um, however, I found out towards the end of the second year that he really didn't know what I did. He didn't take any interest in in what I did, uh, and I also and probably more even. I don't know, worse. I don't know what's worse than that. But um, he was excluding me from meetings that he was including my two peers in. And wouldn't you know it, one of my peers got promoted to VP, and I got reorged under them. Uh, you know, that happens, and you have to deal with it. Um, and I tried, I worked, you know, to deal with that situation and tried, you know, uh, really didn't think about leaving. I don't want to go to another big company because it's just another big company. Same politics, same stuff going on. I just didn't want to do that. Um, but, and I was going to give it about a year because I hit Intel retirement <laughs> in November. So I thought, well, I'll make it to November and then I'll see. And you get some benefits and stuff. Um, and uh, was working with my new boss and told him, I don't trust the GM. He owns my career now. He, he approves a promotion to VP. I don't trust him. I, clearly, he doesn't know what I do and what value I have. And uh, so when I told my boss, so I, a friend called me who I had managed in pre 10 years earlier. He called me, had worked at Ampere from the beginning, and said, hey, we're starting a quality group. You should. I think you'd be great. Um, and uh, I thought about it, and it was a little bit tough, but I got super excited about it. The more I looked at the new opportunity and the more I looked at, well, if I stay, what am I going to do? And it was that part where I was like, oh, I actually don't like the job that my boss is you know, showing me as my next job. I'm like, I've worked with all those people. I don't like those people. I don't want to work with them. So why would I stay, you know? And uh, so yeah, it was uh, actually, I, once I kind of got through the thought process and it took a couple weeks, I was ready to go, super excited. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah. Someone, yeah. Um, when you first started at Intel, what was your like official job title? And, like what kind of work were you doing? Yeah, so I was, uh, I was in the flash group, which is a memory, uh, flash memory. I was, uh, I think a package, uh, design engineer and, and package, not like a box, but uh, when you open up a board and you're looking at a PC board and you see all the little black 
uh, components on there, uh, that's a package. So it's connecting the internal silicon and CPU to the external world. So I was designing those. It was not a glorious job, um, but um, it quickly grew as I showed capability and uh, could do different things. I ended up running, uh, uh, starting up different assembly sites in Manila and Korea, working with vendors, going over there a lot, um, owning, shipping out parts and planning for customer orders. I mean, it was just a, it was almost like a startup feel and it was very rare for someone out of college to be able to do that. So, so yeah, I started as a grade three entry engineer making $37,000 uh, and uh, I was very excited about it, so. We have an online question. Oh. I, I really enjoyed your views on work-life balance and happiness. To your point about how work is becoming more invasive, how do you effectively set boundaries in the workplace without facing scrutiny of slacking off? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, you do have to set boundaries. I mean, right now I don't meet before 8 o'clock because um, I work out and I need to shower and, and get ready. Um, some of that comes with tenure, you know, and you just kind of can force that. But the, it is all about picking the boundaries you want to set. Um, and sometimes you have to go all out, and sometimes you can you can um, establish those those boundaries. Um, I think, though, if you know, like during when I had small kids and needed to spend more time with them, if I uh, I still worked my norm, you know, a full-time job. I was still delivering, but I didn't take on those extra projects because I just needed to have more time at home. Um, I didn't get the raises those years, but I got a, you know, I was still getting raise. Or I didn't get the promotion those years. I was still getting a raise, and I wasn't getting the highest raise, but I knew that my priority was, you know, the kids. And so I set boundaries around that by declining taking on new projects or, you know, hey, I can't be available certain hours because I'm picking them up, dropping them off, whatever it is. Um, and so you can't have everything. You can't draw those boundaries and expect to be promoted, you know, along with people who are working 80 hours. But it worked for me for that longevity of career. And once I'm through that, now my kids are way more independent. They have soccer every night. I work a lot more now than I did then because right now I'm excited about it. So, um, so yeah, you have to set boundaries. And I think being honest and open with your boss. Talk through it. Don't pretend like you're trying to work 80 hours, but you're really only working 50 because you're trying to set boundaries. Tell him or her that you're setting boundaries. Um, they, it's way better for us to know as a manager than to try to pretend. So I think there was one in the back corner there. Thank you. Yeah, um, so the question was um, best way of uh, securing internships. And um, yeah, I think um, my freshman year, my summer, I worked two jobs. I was uh, the intake kind of office person at an ophthalmologist's office. Um, filing paperwork, taking people, doing basic uh, uh, health stuff uh, and questions and leaving them for the doctor. And then I worked at a, at a nursing home, uh, basically manning the desk and then working in the kitchen. So that was my freshman year. Clearly not related to anything that I wanted to do or am doing now. Um, but it was money. Uh, I needed to make money. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, depending on where you're at, don't be too picky to start. Uh, show that you're willing to work, willing to put in the time, that you're consistent and reliable. That's probably number one as you're, as you're starting in freshman and moving up. I think when you get to your sophomore uh, uh, year, trying to get into with a company that you are maybe interested in, uh, doesn't need to be your end-all, be-all company or field, but um, the best way to do it, um, you know, the career fairs, and actually someone brought up the day before the career fair, um, there's like a dinner with industry, uh, and um, I, I forget what they said it was called, maybe you guys know, but um, evening with the industry, okay. Um, getting to know and talking with people 
uh, from the industry. Uh, I've heard that uh, some people, some students I was talking with earlier today said that that was actually very successful. So trying to find a way to make connections with these different companies. Um, going on LinkedIn um, and finding uh, KU alum that work in different businesses. Um, Internships are great for securing uh, your parents' friends. Um, hey, you work at in, you work, your friend works at Intel. Hey, can I talk to them? It's a little bit, it's kind of a, an effort when you're first starting out, but I think finding ways to make those connections is really, um, there are ways to do that through career fairs, that dinner, um, uh, evening with industry, uh, friends, speakers, yeah, industry connections, alumni. Yeah, and just put it out there, you know, um, and really, uh, I think, articulate maybe um, if there's a way or something that you've done that's unique, um, you know, articulating that on, on the resume. So, yeah. Junior year, it gets a little bit easier because you've got more studies under your belt. There's more things to fall back on. And as an employer, I'm, I'm seeing, oh, you've gotten, th you've gotten through, uh, uh, design circuits and RTL validation. Okay, great. You know now you now you can do some of the basic uh, stuff that we need done. So, yeah. In these past two months, um, what differences have you experienced between a big tech company and a startup? Oh yeah. Uh, which do you prefer for a recent? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, in the last two months, what have I noticed between uh, the large company and a uh, startup? Um, and what would I recommend? Um, yeah, so the big company advantages are, you know, it's stable. Uh, you're going to get a paycheck. Um, there are multiple groups to choose from. There are systems and tools in place. So if you need to do something, it already, you know, there's stuff that already exists that you can use to do it. Pretty deep pockets for equipment, you know, capabilities, lab space, you know, kind of the resources are there to help with the job. So that's the benefit of a large company. Um, you can wear lots of different hats in there, and depending on the group, there's opportunity to really spread, uh, spread out and learn a lot of stuff. Um, what I have enjoyed in going to a smaller company is I'm taking all this stuff that I did at the big company, but that I had to run through five different people to get a decision made. I actually am the decision maker at the small company. And so, yeah, I still need to take it through one or two people because I'm still learning, you know, two months, I'm still learning like the history and the context and I don't want to make a decision they had had decided not to make, you know, earlier. And so, but it's so much faster and I own so much more and I am the decision maker and people are so grateful that I'm there because it was a big gap. And so there's just tons of benefits of a small company because you do get to see so much of it. Um, and you get to see a lot of the business side and you get tons of exposure to just a very broad spectrum of skills and business and decisions and everything. So um, if you are okay with the risk, I think startups are, uh, you know, can be a great way to start. Um, this startup is 1,200 people. That's actually not a bad startup to go to because it is more stable. I'm not worried about my paycheck. Um, we're gonna, you know, there's an IPO coming. Uh, and so, um, you know, that one's more stable to me. It's just all, so it's kind of dependent on your risk factor, but you can find those bigger startups uh, and, and go after those. Those are more stable and can offer that security while giving you that huge breadth. So um, it's a super opportunity, not a must do out of college, but man, you're single, it's just you, you're not trying to support a family. I mean, maybe some are, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a great time to kind of take the risk. So um, yeah, it all depends on what you're comfortable with. But it's been super fun and I'm uh, totally excited about the new job and re-energized, so yeah. Very good. Anything else? Well, thank you awesome. very much. Yeah, thank you guys. Parting gifts for you. Oh, I got my KU swag yeah, now. You your KU swag, we got a mug and some things and a, and a 
and a shirt. Yay! So very good. All right. So. Awesome. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Um, have a great night. And yeah. Look forward to seeing you next semester when we resume the series. All right. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it.